the class will come to order. Okay. This is the College of Complexes, and all you complex people had better listen up, because we've got rules here, rules, and the first rule is that there's one fool at a time talking. Uh, so that the rest of us can hear and and uh, hoot. <laughs> now, tonight we have a speaker, one Professor Nick Theodore, who will be talking to us about home economics. Home economics, the invisible and unregulated world of domestic work. And without any further ado, we have our main speaker, Nick Theodore. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks very much for inviting me to be with you uh, this evening. About 10 years ago, we started getting a lot of reports from workers' rights organizations in different parts of the country uh, saying that in this sector or that sector, uh, conditions are getting a lot worse. So we heard from day laborers working in the construction industry, uh, from restaurant workers, from warehouse workers, and so on, uh, from those organizations saying that there, there seemed to be something changing, that the conditions were never great, oftentimes in those industries, but something was getting worse. Uh, and that uh, government enforcement agencies at the federal level, at the state level, really were, were not keeping pace with the rapid changes within the economy. Uh, and that basically employers that wanted to break the rules, unscrupulous employers, pretty much had a free reign to do what they want. And so we started doing uh, a set of research studies on behalf of these workers' rights organizations to try to uncover and bring to light substandard conditions in a range of industries. I was involved in some quite large-scale studies uh, of the construction industry, of low-wage industries in general, and then about two years ago, maybe a little longer, the National Domestic Workers Alliance asked me to uh, join them in a national study of domestic workers, household workers. The National Domestic Workers Alliance is a national network of, I don't know, 38 to 40 uh, workers' rights organizations that many coming out of the immigrant rights movement as well, but workers' rights, immigrant rights organizations, uh, mostly started by domestic workers or former domestic workers to try to change conditions within the industry. And uh, even though I was coming off of a, another very large survey, and I swore I would never do any more surveys, uh, when they asked, I, it was too good an opportunity, and, and I wanted to join them in kind of the struggle that they were doing. So if it's okay, what I'd like to do is to summarize we have this PowerPoint uh, and summarize a little bit of what we found from the uh, what is the first national survey of domestic workers. Um, so there we go. Uh, see, the uh, we collected 2,086 surveys in 14 cities uh, where we surveyed nannies, elder caregivers, and house cleaners. Um, and what our, our effort was, you can see the cities Boston, New York, Washington, D.C., Miami, Atlanta, Chicago, Houston, San Antonio, Denver, Seattle, San Francisco, San Jose, Los Angeles, and San Diego. So we had survey teams in each of those cities uh, in the field surveying nannies, elder caregivers, and house cleaners. Um, this was a, a lot of times when I do major surveys, we do it in different kinds of ways. And what the National Domestic Workers Alliance asked that we do is to make this a participatory project. They wanted domestic workers to be directly involved in all phases of the research, which included designing the survey. We had a team of domestic workers working with us to design the survey questions. Uh, training the, the interviewers, uh, doing the interviews themselves, and then when all the data was collected, we had a meeting in Oakland with about 150 domestic workers where we brought them into a room and started to show preliminary data, and as a group, we, we did data analysis. We were do, and analyzing some of the findings, figuring out what the main stories. And so what, what turned into our report, in many ways, was a joint production between domestic workers, 
these domestic worker organizations and folks like me at UIC uh, that work with these groups. Uh, the, one of the main purposes of this of the study is to try to change public opinion about domestic workers. Um, and you know, I, what the, the point that the National Domestic Worker uh, Alliance makes is that domestic workers are an often unseen but very crucial aspect of the, uh, of, the of the economy and the local workforce. That el and they always mention that elder care givers provide critical assistance uh, and companionship to the to the elderly. Nannies uh, provide and create a safe and affectionate environment for their young charges, and house cleaners care for the homes of, of professionals and, and others uh, who are often too busy to take care of the, the homes themselves. So in many ways, they, 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 domestic workers are involved in key sectors of the economy uh, with the young and the, and the elderly uh, and others that just need, to, uh, need some assistance in making their busy lives a little more straightforward. Um, the, uh, so the you know I think the the idea is that the, the work of domestic workers is um, is invisible. They often labor in private homes behind closed doors and isolated from other workers. Right, so they're usually even though this is the case where the home is the workplace, and usually work, domestic workers are the only workers in the home. Uh, they perform women's work, carrying and cleaning work, which has traditionally been unseen and undervalued. Um, so this work is, is invisible, but it's also been unregulated. Domestic workers are not protected by most workplace standards in the United States, uh, the kind of standards that most workers in this country take for granted. Uh, the National Labor Relations Act bars domestic workers from bargaining collectively or forming unions. Live-in domestic workers are excluded from the overtime provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Domestic workers are not covered by, by the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Uh, and many state laws and regulations explicitly exclude domestic workers. So these factors combine to make domestic workers especially vulnerable to exploitation and abuse on the job. So if it's okay, what I'd like to do now is with those introductory comments is take you inside our survey and show you some of our, our key findings. And I'd like to begin with the question of wages. Our survey revealed the systemic problem of low wages within the domestic work industry. 70% of domestic workers earn less than $13 an hour, and many are paid exceedingly low wages. When, compared, when we compared domestic worker wages to federal and state minimum wages, we found that 28% of nannies were paid below the minimum wage, 27% of caregivers were paid below the minimum wage, and 20% of house cleaners were paid below the minimum wage. For living workers, those workers that, that live it within the home of their employer, the problem of, of low wages was particularly acute. The median hourly wage for living workers is just $6.15 an hour, and two-thirds of living workers were paid below their state or federal minimum wage. You know, when I think about the, the, the survey and the wage uh, numbers, I remember a uh, I did, we also did a set of one-on-one -on -one interviews with a number of domestic workers. And I interviewed a woman named Anna in Manhattan. Uh, she was hired as a live-in nanny for a family of four, uh, living in Midtown. The, the husband of the family was a CFO, a chief financial officer of a five, Fortune 500 company. They were living on Park Avenue in New York City, and she was a live-in nanny. Uh, she began work every day at six in the morning, when the children woke up, and her workday ended around 10 p.m. when she was done cleaning the kitchen. She did the cleaning, the laundry, the cooking, reading to the kids, uh, taking care of the kids, and so on. So basically, all of the household duties you can imagine, she did between 6 in the morning and 10 p.m. And she did it seven days a week. Um, at night, she slept on the floor between the, the two children's beds. Um, when I interviewed her, she had just quit the job. Uh, she had worked every single day for 15 months. So seven days a week for 15 months. She was promised to be paid $1,500 a month, but she only received $620. In other words, Anna's salary was $1.27 an hour. Now I'll admit to you, 
Anna left a lasting impression on me in that interview with her. But make no mistake about it, Anna is not alone. Come on in. Anna is not alone uh, in terms of, of enduring grossly substandard pay and conditions. Uh, you, you probably can't see this too well. Anyway, I'll tell you what it says. But you know, I suppose it's one of the bitter ironies of domestic work. Domestic workers help so many families manage their caring responsibilities and household duties, yet so many domestic workers themselves struggle to support their own families. Because of their low wages, 23% of domestic workers were unable to save any money for the future during the previous month. 37% of workers had no pay, uh, had to pay their rent or mortgage late sometime in the previous year. 20% of domestic workers had no food to eat in their own homes at some time in, their pre in the previous month. One out of five, at, one, at least one point in the previous month, had no food uh, in their home. 40% of workers report paying some of their essential bills late in the previous month. And 60% of workers spend more than half of their income uh, on rent or mortgage payments. So the low wages and the insecurity of the job are directly associated with, with severe financial hardships for large numbers of domestic workers in this country. And so we wind up with a situation where domestic workers' families struggle to make ends meet, while employers' families receive the benefits of their physical and emotional labor. You know, there, there's nothing inherent in domestic work, of course, that justifies this low pay. Rather, it's the very absence of labor protections, um, combined with the economic insecurity of the workforce, that gives employers the upper hand when negotiating pay and conditions. When the private home is also the workplace, formal contracts are, are crucial to ensure some degree of transparency in the employment relationship. I maintain that the, in the absence of effective laws governing employment in the home, a contract becomes the principal means through which employers, employees and work, workers can safeguard their rights. The problem, though, that we have here is that formal contracts are very rare. Just 8% of domestic workers have a written contract with their primary employer. Now, of course, where contracts or verbal agreements do exist, employers do sometimes violate them. We found that 30% of workers reported that their employer had violated one or more of their terms of the contract in the previous 12 months. As domestic workers explained to us, agreements do often get break down over time and workers are routinely expected to do more for the same pay. There's an issue of task creep, even where there are contracts of verbal agreements. As, as the situation within the home changes, domestic workers often find that they do more and more activities, yet for the same pay. In fact, 24% of domestic workers reported that in the last week, they had been assigned work that was beyond their job description. 74% reported they cannot refuse to do the, uh, the additional work, and 67%, so two-thirds, were not paid for the additional time it took to do the work. But that's not a surprise, given that 85% of workers are not guaranteed over, overtime pay in their employment agreement. It's very rare for domestic workers to have a provision to allow them to get overtime pay. I think I fell behind. Anyway, the, um, sorry about that. So, we often think about our, our homes as a safe space, but for domestic workers, they can be hazardous. Two thirds of house cleaners work with toxic products. Many jobs require heavy lifting, climbing, and working on one's knees. Many living workers are, are always on call, and sleep deprivation is common. And only 4% of domestic workers receive employer provided health insurance. Given these conditions, it's not a surprise that, uh, actually, yeah, I wanted to do one more. I added this last second. You probably, sure you can't read this. Anyway, the point here is that living workers are especially vulnerable. 50% um, of living workers work long hours without breaks. 40% um, had to do work that was, that was outside their stated job description. 58% had to work outside their stated hours. Um, and 36% were Oh, I'm sorry, 25% um, were, were allowed fewer than five hours of uninterrupted sleep at night. 
often because they're taking care of, um, of either children or the elderly. Um, and 36% were, were threatened, insulted, or verbally abused. There, there's something about working in one's home uh, that puts workers at an extreme vulnerability and at the same time, I think, emboldens employers to kind of do whatever it is that they want. And so domestic workers relayed a lot of stories of verbal harassment, of sort of, of physical harassment, of sexual harassment, um, and it's just sort of psychological torment at the hands of their employers who are belittling them uh, because of the job they do, because of their immigration status, uh, because of a whole host of other issues. And live-in workers, I think, really bear were bearing the brunt of those kinds of conditions. Workplace injuries are very common uh, within this, this workforce. Um, uh, I'm all out of uh, 47 percent of house cleaners suffer from wrist and shoulder pain. 30 percent, 30 percent had back injuries. 29 percent suffered from skin irritation, and 20 percent reported having trouble breathing. Now that's just the house cleaners, but they're not the only ones. 24 percent of nannies and caregivers suffer from wrist and shoulder pain from picking up their charges and so on. And 21 percent had to deal with back pain. You know, I could go on and on with the numbers, but I think you get the picture. Um, and there's more information in, in the report as well. But people often wonder, you know, why is it that domestic workers don't complain? Why don't they <coughs> protest the substandard conditions that so many work under? Well, a lot of domestic workers do, do protest and they do complain. And sometimes employers do make improvements. But our survey revealed a lot of fear of retaliation. Um, and what domestic workers told us was that 90, 91% feared that if they, if they complained to their employer, 91% thought they would lose their job. 60% were worried that because they need the employer as a future reference, that if they complained, they would not get a good reference from that employer. 59% worried that their pay or hour would be, hours would be cut if they complained about their conditions. And 42%, a staggering 42% feared employer violence. You know, undocumented immigrants um, are burdened with additional fears that immigration status will be used against them if they challenge substandard conditions in the workplace. So workers find themselves in a, in a bind. You know, they, um, the survey showed that, that clearly conditions within the industry are substandard. If, if basic workplace conditions actually covered this workforce, I mean workplace protections actually covered this workforce, um, and if they were enforced, it's indisputable that many workers would be found um, to have been subjected to gross violations of U.S. employment law. On the other hand, workers have caring responsibilities within their own families, and their loved ones depend on them for financial support. Faced with the impossible choice of contesting harm harmful working conditions or providing for one's family through substandard employment, most domestic workers choose the latter and they end up enduring substandard conditions silently and privately. You know, by no means are all domestic work employers bad employers. Many abide by common standards of decency, and they treat workers with dignity and respect. So I don't want to make the case here that all domestic work employers are, are lousy. That's not the case. But at the same time, um, there most certainly is a fundamental problem within the industry uh, without adequate regulations or worker protections, including enforceable standards regarding wages, terms of employment, and conditions in the workplace, the substandard conditions that we've documented in our study are going to continue. And so I think this leads to one, one last conclusion. Uh, the widespread problems that we've documented in our study cannot be resolved at the level of the individual worker or the individual employer. Rather, we think that there's an urgent need for sensible public policies and other strategies that protect the rights of all domestic workers. Um, I've got a couple other slides here that I, I want to add. So the National Domestic Workers Alliance has been pushing a set of policy agendas at the federal and state levels, and I just want to let you know a few of what they think are the primary policy priorities that benefit this workforce. Um, and what they're looking for is a, is a framework that is, um, that is suitable to 21st century employment relations where we've got workers working inside private households. 
And what they're asking for is first the right to freely associate and create frameworks to bargain collectively. And they're working um, with labor attorneys and others to try to figure out what collective bargaining might look like for workers across multiple work sites. They want to see an inclusion in minimum wage standards in every state. So there are many states in the U.S. where domestic workers are not included in the minimum wage law. They want to see um, equal rights to whatever state and federal overtime laws might apply to other workers. They'd like to see these apply to domestic workers as well. Um, and they want to see equal rights to meal breaks, rest breaks, and rest days, uh, depending on what the state laws are uh, in the places where domestic workers work. They want to see the right to adequate hours of uninterrupted sleep for live-in domestic workers. And they're asking for a minimum of five hours of uninterrupted sleep. They want to see domestic workers included in all workers' compensation and unemployment insurance programs. They want to see protection from discrimination, abuse, and harassment. And finally, they want to see inclusion in federal and state health and safety protections. A modest agenda, sort of one that probably should have gotten solved back in 1937. Uh, but here we are in 2013, and uh, we still have conditions here where, where the work is demonstrably substandard. So, I don't know, Charlie, maybe I raced through this too fast, but uh, maybe it makes sense for me to pause and stop talking, let you talk, and we can just have a discussion, or however you do it here. Is that okay? Thank you. Uh, I didn't uh, between hearing a uh, there, but uh, I didn't hear you say. Did you uh, talk to union people? Did you talk to SCIU or AFSCME? Did you uh, uh, find a difference between the unionized workers and the non-unionized? So what we were we were surveying workers who are hired directly from by the households. So these are not workers that are employed through contract companies, um, you know, maid services or anything like that. So these were non; these were all non-union uh, workers, and so we don't know much about the, the comparison of conditions other than what we've seen from SEIU and others that are doing the organizing. Um, so we're not; we were not looking at the organized sector at all. We're looking at the, at the sector that is operating in gray markets or in formal markets where there are direct employment relationships with the household. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah. Are domestic workers covered under minimum wage laws here in Illinois? They are, I believe, yes, that they are covered uh, under minimum wage law in Illinois. Uh, the National Domestic, Worker, uh, National Domestic Workers Alliance, however, is going to be pushing. They, in New York, about a year ago, uh, the governor signed into law the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights in New York, which formalized and made explicit overtime pay and minimum wages and so on. Governor Brown in California just vetoed the law after the, the California Assembly uh, sent, sent it to his desk for signing. Uh, but, but yeah, I know, it's a, a little strange, but he vetoed that law on the last day of the veto uh, you know, before it would expire, and he vetoed it on a Sunday why? night. Why? He did not say why. Uh, the National Domestic Workers Alliance is coming back with uh, with legislation again this year to try to to try to deal with this. Uh, but he did not uh, say why he he issued that veto. Uh, and uh, and but Illinois and Massachusetts are the next two states where they're going to be looking to move that legislation. And so the organizations here that I think are, are most directly involved are Arise Chicago, the Interfaith Worker Justice Group, and the Latino Union of Chicago, which organizes domestic workers and day laborers. Okay, um, everything is uh, commerce, and everything can be contract, and everything can be set up as a trust. There's a gentleman named uh, David Wynn Miller that has... Uh, Showing the world that you can set up a contract and have the verbiage in the contract set up so that everything is a fact. He has rewritten the law, the, um, the Constitution of China, of the Falkland Islands, of Hawaii, 
and I need you to help this situation up. So to make a contract between the, the worker that will be for any situation so that no violations can be set up. Jefferson said that if there's nothing else taught, contract law will right Sorry. Yeah, I, you know, for the for the semester worker organizations, the issue of contracts is right at the top of their uh, list of priorities, probably for the reasons that you're mentioning. You know, I think without a contract, as I said, we lack the transparency in the employment arrangement, and even an employer with the best of will, um, until that until the terms are spelled out, there is the issue of tasks creeping and bleeding into other tasks and so on. So I think a contract is seen as a, as a fundamental mechanism for um, having transparency within that employment relationship that benefits both parties to the employment relationship. It benefits both the worker and the employer. And I think it's necessary no matter how good a will the employer has. Everything is commerce. Mm. So everything is contract. Mm. All right. Uh, Margaret and then Sid. Um, could you talk about um, health insurance? How is there some kind of mechanism, or is there a group that provides health insurance for low-income people? Be, I mean, I, I, I'm going to assume that you know there's all kinds of difficulties with with undocumented workers, with uh, people who really don't have enough money to pay for health insurance. Is that addressed somehow? Yeah, it's not an area I know a lot about. What what I've been hearing from, uh, there have been some conversations with the Vestal Worker Organization and SEIU, who has a health trust for a lot of their workers. And the question is whether domestic workers that are affiliated with the organizations could buy in to some of those programs as a group, which would allow them to get much better coverage than they're going to get otherwise at a much more affordable price. So this is one area where unions and, and domestic worker organizations are trying to strategize and come up with, with different ways to try to extend coverage. As far as uh, unions are concerned, has there been any attempt to organize these people by any, any large union or domestic union? Well, there's been some organizing of, of you know, home care workers and others by SEIU and AFSCME. Uh, but the Right now, the National Domestic Workers Alliance is sitting down with the AFL-CIO to try to find language to change the National Labor Relations Act to allow them to be organized. It, it, the, and the idea is to have them organized either into union-like organizations, like these domestic worker groups, or ideally into unions. Um, even day laborers, it's a, that's an area actually I know a lot more about. There are a couple union locals on the East Coast that organize day laborers that work in, in the construction industry and the weatherization industries. Um, very similar kind of situation where they're often excluded from basic protections. And so I think there's a lot of thinking on the leading edge of collective bargaining on different kinds of structures where workers could collectively bargain. Yeah, I, I hear about contracts, signing contracts. I mean, the contract is value as much as the toilet paper it was written on. Now, under under uh, under the situation when you don't have the power, what the heck are you talking about a contract? If you don't have the backup of the law, that contract is worth shit. <laughs> Not yeah, even so the paper that is written on. I, I, and I can tell you from personal experience, that's, what's the question? Explain what the heck is the contract going to do yeah. unless you change the law. So the, the question is that the, the contract is not worth shit, if I, read, if I can quote, and like okay. toilet paper. Like, that right? <laughs> so I mean, here's, so the, here's the point, I think, with the contract. The 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 con the there is no single the solution the to the, the problems that I've been talking about today. Issue. There is definitely issues of enforcement, but there have to be basic tools, I think, that state what the arrangements are going to be, and that's what the contract does. Again, I think we have a... So the contract with the, the employer that is trying to do the right thing, the contract serves an agreement between the employer and that worker, and I think can, can directly improve the conditions. But in the case where the employer doesn't want to do the right thing, the contract backed up by enforcement and backed up by organizing, I think becomes uh, an enforceable means of, of raising the conditions. And I think it's been important for domestic workers to advocate for those contracts 
as the first step in standing up for their rights. So I think we got to think about contracts in a lot of different ways and understand that them, I, you know, I partly agree that contracts in and of themselves doesn't improve a lot. Like but in the context of organizing, in the context of empowerment and leadership development and, and domestic workers advocating for their rights, I think it can be a quite powerful tool. You realize that a lot of the domestic workers are imported as non-residents, okay? Um, nannies, elderly, caretakers, disabled people, uh, caretakers uh, come from other countries. Uh, sometimes they go back on the same day, such as in El Paso, um, coming from Juarez. So, do you think that regulating and um, the uh, the uh, the enterprise is going to have people look even farther into Philippines or Romania or other? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. So Anna, who I mentioned, she was from the Philippines. She had been a domestic worker with this family when they lived in Singapore. So she was hired from, from the Philippines to Singapore. She worked for this family where the guy worked for the Fortune 500 company. He relocated to New York City with his family and they brought her with. So she came in on a visa, on a work visa to work with that family. It made it tricky for her because they control, they kept her passport. They, um, she didn't know anyone, obviously. They controlled the money and so on. And so she had, um, very limited access to the outside world. They told her New York is a very dangerous place and you're not safe going outside, other than to walk the children to school and take them home. Uh, I talked to other workers who had been trafficked, another uh, worker from the Philippines had been trafficked uh, by the church that she was a member of at the age of 17, came to New York City. Um, they told her this was uh, the way to serve God was to go with this minister and his family. And she worked, um, not basically not leaving the house for three years. She, the, her time was up and she was heading back to the Philippines. She went to JFK airport, said, I'm, I've got to run to the bathroom and escaped. Wow. So, there, you know, I think with, with workers that are coming in that kind of situation, there's a lot of vulnerability. Uh, I talked to one worker, she was paid in pesos. She lived in the US, but was paid in pesos. So she had no money. She had money, she, had money, she just couldn't spend it. So she couldn't go anywhere. So there are a lot of situations where workers are uh, are in that kind of vulnerable situation. And I think, yeah, I think for employers that are not looking to do the right thing, that becomes the workforce of choice. And I think that there is a danger that as we improve conditions in the industry, those employers will try to find ways, um, you know, to, to do the kind of low road practices that they some of them do. But can you regulate those that, let's say, even don't have a work visa? and come here to... Yeah, get, you're, you're talking about undocumented immigrants. That, uh, not just immigrants, tourists even, or people who are residents of another country and go back and forth. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea here, I mean, well, certainly what these organizations, work. these organizations work with whoever comes. Many of them have bases in the, in the, the nationality. So there's a, in New York, there's a work a organization that just works with the Nepalese workers and another one with Filipino workers, another with Brazilian workers, and so on. And so I think what they're trying to do is work within those communities of foreign nationals to try to educate, improve conditions, empower, and so on. And I think that, that there's a lot that can get done through organizing. It's not the end of, the, it's not the end of it. I, I realize, you know, what you're suggesting, I think there are a lot of difficulties here for those not workers. Not suggesting anything. Well, no, I think it's, it's, but there's a vulnerability there, I think, when you don't, ha when you're not from the country and that you're not uh, entirely sure what the rights are. Okay. Russell Johnson and South Carolina. I think to me, most of these industries that do all this uh, abusing of the workers happen to be all the ones that are using all the illegal alien labor. Yeah, I mean, that's been a, it's been a big issue. I mean, we've got a, a large group of workers in this country that are, that have second class status or worse, and a lot of industries that have come to rely on that labor, and they extract massive cost savings 
in the form of low wages, no benefits, and substandard conditions. So, yeah. what immigration I'm, reform is a big piece of this. You can't get rid. You can't have a contract when you're dealing with illegal aliens, and these people who hire them just take advantage of them. But you, you can. I think you can have a contract if they're organized. So let, let me take you back to day laborers, which I know well. So day laborers, people who stand in public spaces looking for work. The study we did found that 75% were undocumented. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, we surveyed 2,660 day laborers in 20 states. So this is a group that they work, they have no stable attachment to an employer. 75% are undocumented. They're from all manner of countries, from Central and South America to Eastern Europe to Africa, and they're and they compete with each other head to head on the corner. If he gets the job, I don't get the job. Now this is the definition of an unorganizable population, you would think, but actually the day labor workforce is a site of some of the most innovative organizing going on in this country. So they they overcome the national differences, they overcome the economic need that we may both face as we go for that job. Um, and so I, I, I dispute the fact, the, the idea that undocumented immigrants can't organize. Actually, I think it's some of the most interesting organizing going on these days. The thing is, you also have to have strict uh, punishment for the people who hire and exploit them. Yeah. They wouldn't be coming here if it wasn't for all these employers giving them jobs. And then uh, Americans and uh, and legal aliens uh, and legal cannot get jobs. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think this is the issue that was raised about the contract. There, there needs to be an enforcement mechanism always. But I, I think we've got to, we're about to engage in a, another round of difficult immigration reform debate in this country. I think we've got to get to a situation where we don't have millions of second-class workers in this country undercutting wages and being exploited at the same time. It doesn't help when we do have laws and now one wants to enforce them. Yeah, we have another person now. And you're also right. <laughs> Immigrants, regardless of their status, are covered by the labor laws of the United States. That, there's, that doesn't mean that if you hire an illegal immigrant, you, are, you don't have to pay minimum wage. The question I have is, and I realize, I'm, I heard something here, why don't they organize as a union? How in the world do you have a union of a thousand independent contractors with a thousand different employers scattered who knows where? What court of work standards do you apply? What sort of grievance procedure do you have? And last of all, what's this cockamamie kind of alternative organizing that you think is so cool? <laughs> so that is outside of the labor law, what, some kind of marching around? <laughs> this is what they have to settle for? No. So the, the problem for domestic workers is that there was a compromise made uh, back in the 1930s to appease southern politicians uh, and farm workers and domestic workers were excluded from a lot of the labor protections that existed. Now the farm workers fought a lot of those fights and things have changed for them. But domestic workers are barred at this, at, at this moment in time from collectively bargaining uh, and doing that type of organizing. So as we speak, we've got a bunch of lawyers with the AFL-CIO and elsewhere trying to figure out ways to try to law, change that law and to think about how you do collective bargaining across multiple work sites and multiple employers. I have no idea what they're going to come up with. But in the meantime, we've got a void. We've got a group of workers out here that are enduring substandard conditions uh, and sometimes rampant exploitation. And if they cannot be organized into unions, then we better have, in the meantime, some sort of alternative organizations that, that through which they can fight for laws like the New York Domestic Workers Bill of Rights and hopefully what will become the Illinois Domestic Worker Bill of Rights. So this cockamamie organizing I'm talking about is domestic workers themselves banding together to influence policy, to try to learn their rights, to try to advocate with employers for a different way of doing business around here. And in an absence of, of union agreements for these workers, I think those, those kinds of organizations are fundamental to changing conditions in the industry. Okay, Joe Mayer, uh, then Peter.
and Tim. Do you have any indication of, or any way to compare the organizations in Europe of domestic workers with those in the United States? Yeah, I don't, uh, that's not anything I've looked at. Uh, you know, there's a lot, what's interesting is that the, the movement to improve domestic workers' rights is a global movement. The International Labor Organization, a little over a year ago, uh, signed the first convention, the International Convention of Domestic Workers, and while there's only one signatory, which I think is Paraguay or Uruguay or somewhere, uh, there, it is, it, it's reflective, I think, of, of a global movement of, of workers in South America, in Hong Kong, in Europe, and elsewhere, organizing uh, and trying to change conditions. So, you know, I think it's an interesting moment, um, and it's, it's a global movement that is trying to change these conditions. Uh, Peter. Uh, so who are these workers? What's the profile? By gender, age, education? Uh, how, what percentage are immigrants? I'll tell you. The, uh, I'm glad you asked. Other people may not be glad you asked. But anyway, so it's, it's an overwhelming uh, female population. We found 95% uh, were, were women. Uh, the, the most common age is uh, 45 to 64. We found about 40% were in that 45 to 64 age range, maybe a little bit older than many of you had thought. Uh, another almost 40% were 25 to 44. So, you know, what does that mean? Almost 80%, somewhere, you know, 25 to 64. Um, the, um, what, should, what else do we want to say? 65% uh, were U.S. citizens, right? So 35% were non-citizens. We estimated 53% were undocumented, so without, without legal documents. Okay, that's 53% of the foreign board then? Yes, 53% of the foreign board. 53% of the foreign board. 35. Yep. Okay, are these women, are they married? Do they have husbands? Yep, we found, we found that in our survey, 32% were married in the, the third. Some of these, these questions are answered by the census, uh, and they found 40% were married. So somewhere between 32% and 40% were married. Um, what else? What else do you want to know? I, I can tell okay, you more. Uh, most of your Telephone pictures number? were Latin American and black people. Is that uh, two of all of them, or what, what's the breakdown on that? Yeah, the, so the photos were stock photos that the organizations had, and so uh, there were a number that were Afro-Caribbean from New York and, and others from, from... Yeah, that gives the impression it's 100%, but what's the actual yeah. breakdown? Uh, yes. Um, so the census says that 46% are white, whether it's foreign-born or U.S.-born, but they say the census says 46% were white, 10% uh, are black, 38% are Latino, and 6% are Asian, other. Um, our numbers turned out to be a little bit different, uh, because, partly because of the cities that we surveyed in. So our numbers were a little higher uh, Latino and less um, and lower in terms of whites. But uh, that's what the census says. It, it, it turns out to be quite a diverse workforce. All right, let's turn the question around. If I was needing to hire people like this, what would you recommend that I do to be in compliance with the law and in order to make sure that they were, were good and that, you know, frankly, if I'm going to be having people in my house, I want some people who are reliable, good, maybe cheap, but, you know, you, you, you get what you pay for yeah. in a lot of ways. What would you recommend I do? Well, what, what the organizations say, so the question is, if you're trying to hire a domestic worker, how do you, how do you play by the rules? And, um, you know, in terms of the reliability, I think so much domestic worker hiring occurs through word of mouth and word of mouth references. That was one of the reasons why domestic workers are so worried about challenging conditions, that you rely so heavily on those references. Uh, I think to, to do the right thing, I think, you know, the, the important thing is to have um, a detailed and then a detailed conversation about tasks, pay, and conditions with workers, and then to revisit those conversations on a periodic basis, you know, at least every year. Um, and, and I think what we see is more and more domestic workers know what the going rate is, and, and there's not a lot of deviation. Uh, you know, there, there are wages and hours, they all kind of cluster in a narrow band. And so domestic workers are going to be able to state, in most cases, 
if you're trying to hire one, what they're looking for. I think the key thing is to have those kinds of contracts and agreements and then to revisit them. Over there. So the domestic worker organizations put model contracts online, and then a number of the agencies also have contracts that could serve as a model for how an employer might want to draw up an agreement. So there, it's not that there are no resources there to help someone design a contract. They're definitely, they're definitely out there. <laughs> okay, any more questions? You solved all our questions. There you go. Yeah, I mean, for in our survey, of course, we're only catching them while they're domestic workers, and we do know that domestic work can be a stepping stone into other jobs. I think what what the worker organizations are trying to do are trying to improve the training so that domestic workers can pick up additional training, uh, raise their wages, and maybe move into other caring occupations. Um, I think where we see the most mobility uh, probably is with, I don't even know where the most, I don't know where it is. I, depending on the worker, depending on the occupation, we see different paths of mobility. For house cleaners, when they get going well, they may have a stable of houses and may be able to actually start to perform the function of an employer where they can hold more houses and hire friends or uh, relatives into those jobs and build up a little mini business. For caregivers, I think what we need to see is a little more training to allow them to have a little more labor market mobility. But most domestic workers I've ever met, this is their occupation, this is what they want to do. Um, and so for them, the, the point is not to leave the occupation, it's to improve it. Yeah. Yeah, back there. Yeah, I was curious, I didn't think some things about congressmen, but how many of these people are employed, let's say, undercover or outside of normal employment type condition? Pretty much everyone that we surveyed is in that kind of situation. I guess, a, you know, where it's an informal arrangement or a gray market. So we're dealing with with people who are employed directly by families, so there is no employment agency involved. Do they pay payroll tax? No, no. No, there's none of that. There's very little in terms of Social Security. Some employers do pay into Social Security for their workers, but many do not. Uh, many workers told us some claim to do it, and then when they left, they found actually the money had never been paid in. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it's definitely a, it's an informal arrangement for everyone that we interview. Louder, please. Unions? I think that what you're saying is that you're against unions and you don't think it's a good idea for them to become part of unions. No, I'm against unions. You're against unions, all unions. Yeah, are you for unions or against? I'm for unions. Uh, yes, I'm for unions. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Yeah, she was here, but she wasn't here. So what percentage? What percentage are paid in cash? It was overwhelming. I mean, that's the typical uh, cash or, or you know, personal check is, is almost so is everybody. If they're paid in cash, what percentage of the is that? Probably close to zero of those paid in cash. Yeah, it's it's operating outside of those arrangements. How, you, how could you organize cash uh, group like that? People who don't pay taxes. You know, it's interesting. You talk to a lot of uh, a lot of workers that are paid in cash, not just in this industry, but in others. And the point is that they'd like to get legit. I think they they would like to have this all get moved above board. And the, and the question is how to do that and why. You know, obviously there are some short-term benefits, but for those that want to stay, they'd rather pay into Social Security and want to, um, you know, make a life here in the United States. And I think they'd like to get legit. Yeah. I have a question, and that is, 
It would be very hard to argue that domestic workers are independent contractors. Uh, they're working in, in a workplace, usually with supplies provided by the employer, uh, and they're directed uh, by the employer and what they want them to do. So I think it's hard to argue that we're looking at an independent contracting situation. Oh, nice. No. Uh, but as you know, as the point about cash payments involved, we got a messy thing. It's, it cuts both ways. Yeah, it cuts both ways. And uh, you know, I think what the domestic worker organizations would like to see happen is, uh, like I said, they're they're in favor of amnesty. You know, there are a lot of employers that would like to do it the right way. It's not always clear how to do it the right way. Can we can we get to a point where we say let's just get from here on out we're going to do it the right way? And I think that's what they're looking for. Nominees for Attorney General about two years ago. Zoe Baird? Yep. Yeah, that's one of them. I can't think of the other one. Other than that, do you have any idea how that happened? Uh, you know, I think it just shows that even people that are going to be going in the top levels of law in this country, when it comes to hiring domestic workers, it's not always clear what to do. And I don't, my, I don't know if these people had malice in their hearts or what they were. I think they just did what everybody else does, which is enter the gray market, so make some like decisions, and then they paid a, a career price for Thank it. You. But, you know, I think it just shows that even top lawyers find it difficult to figure out exactly how to do this correctly. Yeah, maybe I missed it, but did you give a figure for the total number of such workers that there, uh, that there are in the United States and the total amount of money that's involved here in terms of their... Yeah, no, no real sense of the... the, the total amount of money involved in this industry. Uh, in terms of the number of workers, I think we estimated in a different project about 800,000 workers that are hired directly by employers. Uh, there are some bigger numbers out there, but using the census uh, numbers, that was our estimate. About 820,000, I think. How come the IRS hasn't jumped on these more aggressively? Because that's a huge amount of money that they're losing. Presumably yeah. the people aren't going to pay taxes. Nothing is withheld. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably mostly. The, we didn't ask a lot of the tax, the tax questions, but you know, in informal conversations, I think that's reasonable to believe. I think the problem for the IRS is you'd be going. It's it's a hidden employment relationship. Yeah, and hard to find. Hard to find, and you have to do it one on one by one by one. It's expensive. It's expensive to pursue it. Yeah. So Joe, I've seen recent advertisements on television for agencies offering landing services with a complete background check on the person you want to select. Is that quite that widespread? Yeah, agencies are, are growing um, for all manner of household work, nannies, house cleaners, and so on, and they're offering a number of, uh, of benefits to employers, including background checks and others. Um, so, you know, I think the real question for the, the prospective employer is, are you willing to pay for that service? Or can you get an effective referral elsewhere from people you know and, and trust? So I think there, there, like anything, there's a market for this. Uh, and every once in a while there'll be a horrific story, I think it was just one again this week, of uh, you know, a nanny misbehaving toward children. And you know, I think it gives uh, a business boost to those kinds of agencies. But many, many people go hire workers outside the agency structure. Another nominee that you were looking for was Kimball Wood. Um, Kimball Wood. Um, another nominee that, that ran afoul of uh, Nanny, Gate. Nanny, Nanny Gate. Yes. All right. We can move to our rebuttal. <laughs> Thank you very much. Then we can allow more time to speak. <laughs> Marks to make on this subject, or, uh, or on whatever. Uh, 
Go about 10 minutes a piece. Move, move that around towards more towards the. I think I need somebody to come in and clean up my place now and then. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'd like to thank the speaker. This is a subject that uh, I've been kind of interested in for a number of years because I'm a member of Jane Addams Senior Caucus. And we're interested in the community care program in the state of Illinois because these uh, workers are in a more formal situation and uh, uh, they serve us seniors who need help in our own home. That help might be uh, uh, going to the store, or it might be cleaning your apartment, or doing your laundry, or personal care, toileting, dressing, and bathing, this sort of thing. So we've had a relationship with the community care program of the state of Illinois for a number of years, and it shows you the value of formalizing these relationships, because there are rules and regulations and uh, there are actually under two groups uh, of agencies in the state of Illinois. Uh, the community care program itself is handled by the Department on Aging. The Department on Aging uh, uh, is for uh, uh, people who are over uh, 59 and a half. They might be seniors, they might be people with disabilities. The uh, Department of Human Services Rehabilitation uh, takes care of people who are uh, 59 and a half or younger uh, and they there are slightly different uh, situations in both. In the community care program of the state of Illinois, almost all the workers come through an agency. They're uh, working for an agency. And many of them are, re are represented by SEIU, Service Employees International Union. Now, the Department of Human Services Rehabilitation, some of the people work for agencies and some of the people are selected by the person with a disability. They select their own uh, attendant, but in those cases there's still some formal situation where a counselor looks over that situation. I'm not saying that these are perfect, but at least there's a third party uh, looking in on all these situations. It's not just the worker and the person who is uh, getting the work. So to me that's a uh, big uh, uh, improvement and uh, I think a union is a big improvement. Uh, Jane Adams Senior Caucus works very closely with the uh, SEIU. In fact, SEIU gave us $5,000 Almost every year they give us $5,000, which we're very grateful for, and we work very hard to make sure that uh, the workers that work for seniors are professionally trained, uh, have uh, uh, so training, ethics, and decent pay. So all of those things are uh, important parts of this. I'm going to take the next minute or so to repeat what I said earlier. It's an old uh, story at the College of Complexes. You can talk about something that has nothing to do with the subject. So remember the, uh, the uh, uh, Scrap the Camp campaign. Uh, get yourself a flyer. I don't know where the flyer oh, the flyer's over here. Get yourself a flyer. Read all about it. Fill out, fill out the cards and bring me some uh, some uh, bottle caps of some sort. But whether you bring the bottle caps or not, you can sign the cards and, and give them back to me. And that will help all of us here 
in the room who are at least under, those of you who are under 60 years old, uh, the old folks uh, already are getting Social Security, and I think it'll last for the next two or three years. But a lot of you, I see a lot of you are younger, and we uh, seniors want to make darn sure that this program is around for you uh, in years to come. So thank you. I'll collect them next week, or if you got them today, I'll take them. Thank you, Seymour. Uh, yeah, I would like to disabuse some people the, the idea that having a contract it makes any difference unless you have the power of the law behind it. And even if you do, then you need a lawyer, you need to be able to pay him, and you need to be able to pay him depending on who are you against it. You have to be maintaining a continuous effort for many, many years. So um, we have to really uh, think about what we're thinking about contracts, how, how they mean. If somebody is going to sign a contract with you shaking the hand and he means to keep it, they will keep it. If they are not intended to keep it, you can do anything you want with the paper, but it's not going to serve you very much. Are you directing, I have, that, are you directing that at me? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to you and anybody who thinks so. about canon law, it's, it's my it's my turn. We can we can sit later and talk about it. But I have signed a contract with the president of the big corporation here in the United States in Chicago, and uh, at the at the end of a couple of years, he came and he wrote the paper. He tore it apart and he said, "Well, that's it. We are not going to." We are not going to go buy the contract. I have a copy. I went to my lawyer and he said, what do you want to do with the paper? You want to use it? Toilet paper? Or you want to spend your life fighting with this corporation? And so, due to the fact that my resources are limited and my emotional uh, capacity to sustain that kind of fight was limited too, I told the lawyer, forget it. And that's not the only one time that happened. It happened three times to me in Chicago. Oh. And different opportunities. As a matter of fact, I think it's four. Because I rented a industrial building. And the landlord, because he decided to change the rent or change whatever, he cut the elevator. So I have a business, but I don't have an elevator. And then he cut the heating on the building. And I hired a lawyer. It took me years. I paid the lawyer. I never won anything. So if you think that um, without having the support of the law, like uh, the speaker was saying, if the workers don't have the right to organize because of the law of the state, or like in this country we have very, very limited protection by the government, we are lost. Uh, I called, uh, I was working in a hospital. Uh, and I called OSHA because they were asking a guy with a heart condition to go in a very, very, very high ladder and paint the wall without harness. And the guy used to once in a while have this heart condition. When OSHA came, they entertained OSHA and hung the harnesses on the guy and said, go up there. And so OSHA came, oh, they're okay. And they went away. Uh, you know, when people are, are, are going to cheat and, and abuse, they are going to do it. So you, you, have, you need the support of the law. At one time, we had about 35% of workers were in unions, probably during the uh, 50s and the 60s, but then after a while, there was there was the uh, anti-labor laws that came into being, like the Taft-Hartley law and laws of that nature, and the employers were, were in the driver's seat to a large degree. Now we only have about seven to ten percent people that are in unions. So we, in the United States, we probably have the most anti-union industrialized country in the world, right here in the United States. And that's one of the reasons, I think, 
that the uh, workers, the domestic or industrial or whatever have you, well, they don't have much power because there's not too many people in the labor unions. If you go to a place like Sweden or to some of the Scandinavian countries, about 85% of the workers are unionized. And that's why they got the benefits that they have there. It's because of the struggle of the workers to organize and to put pressure on the employers. This is the only way you get anywhere in any of these industrialized capitalist countries. So we're, we're, labor is in a bind in the United States. For one thing, the ideology of the United States is very anti-labor. I remember I was in the hospital, in the hospital, and this guy comes in, and he's uh, some sort. Of, uh, he had a particular title, and uh, he he wasn't a nurse or anything, but he had a, a title. And I asked him if he belonged to a union. Right away, he comes up with these anti-union. Ideolo is these ideologies that unions are not good and, 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 and it doesn't help the workers and you have to pay money for corrupt uh, union, union uh, bosses and things of that nature. So there's been a very strong ideological trend in the United States to be very anti-union. And the only way that's going to change is people get together all unions get together and start demonstrating and start, uh, uh, you know, marching and things like that and putting pressure on the, on the uh, employers and on the government to enact labor laws that are more friendly to unions. Of course, in a capitalist country, workers are wage slaves for the most part. And the employer try to get, tries to get the most out of these people and try to, tries to get the highest uh, profit, and that's to maximize their profit. And this is the way it's done in a capitalist country, maximizing profit, trying to pay uh, workers as little as they possibly can to maximize the profit. Like right now you see CEOs and people in the upper uh, branches of, uh, of the corporations getting these fabulous salaries millions of dollars and some of them even make up to a billion dollars so one tenth of one percent got most of the wealth in the united states and where do they get it from they get it by exploiting the workers that's where all that wealth comes from so this is the type of situation that the workers are trying to solve and the only way to do it is to organize and put pressure on the employers. That's the only way they're going to get anywhere. And if they don't do it, they're not going to get ahead. So it's not only the uh, domestic workers, but it's all workers. And once that is done, the pressure is put on them to treat all workers good. I'm going to take a slightly different approach to uh, labor exploitation, servants, and other kind of workers. 100 years ago, being a butler or a domestic worker in a large manor house or some rich person's thing was a career. It may not have paid a lot, but for some of those people, it was a viable career because you know, it was hard to get good help even back then. But you could always, the vast majority of the homes in the United States, if, especially if they were like an upper middle class or a higher class, had servants. And there was a culture in there. What caused the demise of the servant? It was the rise of the factory the rise of industrial capitalism and the rise of uh, the consumer economy. Today, we were seeing that go globally, worldwide. And with the, with the introduction of labor-saving devices, the introduction of more mechanization in the workplace, and particularly in the home, 
it has led to not needing a lot of people who need who for servants in there. And a lot of times too, we now see the rise of a lot more service industries like made like house cleaning services where they come in once a week to clean up. Now, I also happen to have a friend of mine who for a while was a professional nanny. She graduated from a good college and she found two families that basically were, she was unemployed from her first job as a financial officer for about two years and she came into the home of a friend who employed her for well over six years as a professional nanny and she went on to a second place for another ten. She then got back into the financial industry because she kept on her uh, credentials up. But you know, what really stops enslavement of, of people, what really stops the thing is power. Good old fashioned power that comes from electricity and labor saving devices and other things that help society mechanize and bring a little bit more specialization of labor. The Industrial Revolution may have caused a lot of upheaval, but it was probably one of the best things that ever happened in the world today to bring people out of slavery. And at the same time, the rise of the unions was one of the best things that improved workers' lives. You wouldn't have the union movement without the Industrial Revolution. If it wasn't for the Industrial Revolution, we'd still all be on farms on some kind of subsistence living, going to the man or lord of the house, where a servant would be a good thing, to, would be a good job. But thank God today, you know, you, it used to, we used to be a nation of farmers. 50 to 75 percent produced the amount of food that we need. Now we do it for less than two to three percent. And jobs have come out of that to make sure that the rest of the population is employed. In the future, we're seeing an aging population. And it's not gonna be too much longer before the United States will have to start paying people to come here to work. And this exploitative thing will, will not be as rampant as it normally is. And again, it'll be thanks to industrialization around the world. And when countries do industrialize, the population does go down. And that is because when children are sent from a source of labor to uh, an expense, people love them, but they'll have a lot less of them. So I'm, in a sense, very hopeful about conditions of domestic workers being raised, especially with you know the increasing forms of contract law, unionization, some kind of organizing, but at the same time, I think the best long-term solution is to continue the way we're going with the development of the world economy under a capitalistic system. And if you think I'm crazy, Charlie, we just need to power it a different way than what we're doing now. Personally, I think that's going to be thorium, but that's a whole other argument for another night. Thank you. You know, there are many minerals in the ground, gold, silver, uranium, and so forth, and these minerals are good for society and ought to be exploited. There are vegetation, corn, wheat, and barley, and they're good for humankind and they should be exploited. And then you have you have producers, men who know how to get things done. People like Henry Ford or Andrew Carnegie or John Astor. Bill Gates. And uh, they take people and they employ them to do work and they get a pay. Without these men, many thousands of people would have sat around and starved to death. So, uh, the, what I'm really saying here is that people should be exploited. Uh, they want to be exploited for as much as possible, and as long as they get the wage that, they're, uh, that they have agreed on, 
uh, then they really don't have anything else to say. And in the meantime, great buildings can be built and uh, uh, big corporations and factories and so on that continue to go on and on and on. Here, here. Like uh, Ford or uh, like Ford Motors or, or um, Google Steel or what have you. One fool at a time. Yeah. Uh, so the the fact is that uh, uh, there are great men who can get things done and set a ball rolling, and then you have the rest that are intended to be exploited. And that's all I've got to say. <laughs> I could hardly believe my ears just now. <laughs> and people were applauding. Yeah, that people deserve to be exploited. Now, I grant that Henry Ford was an able executive. And I actually can think of a number of good things to say about him, and also a number of bad things. He fought labor unions tooth and nail, uh, and it wasn't until 1941 that the United Auto Workers were finally able to organize the Ford Motor Company. He was a terrible anti-Semite who, who circulated <laughs> yeah, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion free of charge. The Nazis picked up that propaganda and circulated it all over the world. But they were efficient. Yes, they were. And he printed an endless number of anti-Semitic stuff in his newspaper, the Dearborn Independent, until finally enough people protested that it stopped. My own great uncle, may he rest in peace, would never buy a Ford car. He was so angry at Henry Ford. Andrew Carnegie also is another example of Somebody else who fought the unions tooth and nail, although a lot of that, admittedly, was his partner, Henry Clay Frick. Still, Mr. Carnegie didn't exactly overrule Mr. Frick. Now, granted, he also gave millions of dollars to establish libraries and so on. Henry Ford and his son established the Ford Foundation. But all the same, I'm sorry, I'm not in favor of anybody being exploited. And as for digging minerals out of the earth, yes, we need to do a certain amount of that. But having said that, too often in the past, we've made a complete mess of this planet by doing that. And we're all paying the price for that in terms of global warming, even now as we speak. Finally, with regard to most of what Tim said, he left out one, one, one small point. Okay. One of the reasons why servants disappeared was when in, Con in 1924 when Congress cut off the immigration from Europe. That dried up a large pool of cheap labor that was coming from over there. An open mic. All right, I guess I gotta get up there. All right, let's sing a speaker again. I'm still working on my, my notes here. All right, thanks not only for your presentation, but bringing to light, um, you know, a serious situation here. And to reiterate, 1935, they passed the Wagner Act. And in order, Roosevelt, in order to get it passed, and he needed the votes of the Southern, at that time, Democrats. And two categories of employees were excluded, of course. The agriculture and the domestic workers, which tells you something about the culture of the South, which still persists to this day. It's a backward place. Um, a, a common misconception Something like the United Farm Workers were in fact the union and just like the uh, United Auto Workers or my own the machinists, uh, that was not the case. They were excluded. 
and they had tried to achieve state recognition in order to represent employees. Um, and that's the route that they were going, at least in California. It's, not, it's a very difficult situation to organize a union as it is. Let me tell you, sometimes when I read, I'm not, a, I'm not really in the organizing aspects of it, but when I read about what they have to go through and they get a contract and things like this, I just shake my head that I'm surprised that a union ever gets organized in the United States under the current situation. I mean that. It's actually, we did it recently, and I, I'm serious. The, my, my partner did it, and he was just so persistent for years it took him to do, to add a unit. It's just some consent, and he's a very intelligent guy. And it, that's, it's rare that you can find individuals who will persist that long. And yeah, he's, I'm sorry, I have to agree with Frank. All day, all week long, I, I try to engage in contract enforcement. That means nothing. It means nothing unless you have some, some penalty, some mechanism. Otherwise, it's just language. I was adding a new, uh, a, a new steward, and she was dealing in some of the handicapped issues. She kept saying, well, this is the law. This is the law. They have to do it. It's the law. I said, what, what the fuck is that supposed to mean? They don't think like the law every day. You know, you go in and say, oh, this is the law, you know, and all of a sudden, what, the world changes. You know, come on. The law means nothing. Like Frank was telling the story, it means absolutely nothing. I mean, that, but um, tragically, I think that's about the only way they're going to get some standards here in this kind of industry. It's incredibly difficult to organize. I was wondering, how do you organize employees like this? Do you do it on a geographic basis or what? Um, I have to disagree with you. Some of these worker centers, they seem to draw some interest. I support them. I contribute to them. Um, I don't know if that's the route to go. They, they want to represent people who aren't eligible for normal representation. Um, I guess it's commendable. We, we're all in the House of Labor. Um, but I think the legislative route would be about the only way to go, and you need some enforcement body behind it, and you need some penalty body behind it, or perhaps a blend of something like that. All right, going over the worker centers. Um, let's see here. You're talking about the great changes that have come about because of the Industrial Revolution. Yes. I was thinking, are you referring to the vacuum cleaner? <laughs> which has radically changed the careers and lives of domestic workers. The washing machine, <laughs> the dishwasher. The washing uh, machine, the little new mops, and <laughs> those towels that last a thousand years. It's done a great service to <laughs> bring the, the new, drudgery the out. The new dust mops. <laughs> <laughs> What are you talking about? It was your devices to relieve the luxury of housework. And if I don't work in a factory or something, I have to work for the Lord or the manor. You know, it's my, my choice. And last of all, I don't know why I paid three bucks. Oh, by the way, I, I forgot this announcement. The Climate Crisis Conference, if anybody announced it next week, the 16th. Anyhow, you can pick up one of the cards. And I know you're trying to yank our team here, but I am not one of those who, I guess people, what, by virtue of birth, some are intended to be exploited and others are not. I don't know how we arrived at this bicameral division of society, <laughs> but perhaps the Libertarian Party. And please, sir, one person died per week in those steel mills of Andrew Carnegie, mm -hmm. and he didn't care. He made no provision for the widows and the children. I don't have much regard for people like that. Now, you can say they made some contribution to society. I think he should have been put in jail. I'm not for the death penalty. 
but I think he should have been arrested and put in jail along with the other guys for the rest of their lives. You do not exploit people for your own personal profit, certainly to the point at which people will suffer injury and or death. There's no justification for it. And you guys may think they made some contribution to our society. I, I have a hard time finding out what it is exactly. Nevertheless, thank you very much. I invited them to come back. Tell us about urban studies. Thank you very much. I, I don't know how to follow all that, but I, I will remind you of the, the old saying that there is one thing worse than being exploited by capitalism, and that's not being exploited by capitalism. And so, but tell me really, are, is that our choice, this bicameral society? Uh, tell me there's got to be something more than this. Yes. And I think, you know, as you're saying, that, that labor isn't a bind in the United States right now. And we b very badly need a revitalized labor movement. Um, the, and, and I think what we're, what we're moving toward is a, is a revitalized labor movement that looks a little bit different. And I, I still contend that these worker centers and workers' rights organizations are part of the, the big tent, the labor big tent, and I think that they're stepping in and calling our attention to problems and sectors of the economy that really we tend not to look at and tend to ignore. And I think what their, what their efforts are, are a bold statement to step forward and say we will not be ignored uh, and we need to we need to improve conditions in these in these sectors. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you. It's a it's a lively and uh, All right. and give us the website of where we can find the report. Give us your website and a little bit more background about you before you sign off. So the the website where the report can be found uh, is at the website of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, NDWA.org. Um, and I think that's the best way. And then my own faculty website is at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, the address is so complicated I can't remember it. But uh, you know, in the worldwide world of the World Wide Web, you can find me. So I really appreciate the opportunity to come and be with you this evening. And uh, thanks. All right. Ambrose Beers to find litigation. As a process, a man enters as a pig and emerges from as a sausage. <laughs> and uh, I think we've got enough complications. You guys are trying to, you are everyone laws for everything. Laws, I mean, what's that? as opposed to, you don't really have an understanding of bargaining position. Except, the only way you can understand bargaining position is to exclude scabs so there's a shortage of workers for the employer. Now, I would put it, what I've been trying to tell you guys for years is the capitalists have a union, so if there's a shortage of employers. And, uh, no, a lot of these questions can be resolved in terms of supply and demand. I think you guys ought to, there's a, there's a Wall Street slogan that you guys ought to apply to your own circumstances. You can't push on a string. And that's what you're trying to do with all these laws and everything. You're trying to push on a string without really looking at the supply and demand that makes up these situations. In California, Today, they still fighting the farmer to have a law that equate the protection that the animals have. In California, they can fine you if you don't provide water and shade for a dog or a, or a horse. But if you are a... Hey! Lady, you talk too much. Yes. So there is a, a law that protects an animal and protected with a fine that could go into five hundred dollars if you don't provide the water or the shade. But the far the owners of the farms are fighting this law that it was proposed to provide for water 
and shade for the workers who are working for hours under the sun. So this is the condition that if you like to live in a world like that, well, I think that I don't like to be your friend somehow. Capitalism has delivered the goods, pure and simple. Look at the evidence. 300 years ago, most of the country and the world was in an agrarian society. Now, if you look around the world, we're developing, we're getting education, we got good companies and good employers in a lot of cases, and yes, we do have bad. But I think the march of human progress has been well impeded by capitalism. The invention of the revenue bond, the invention of the corporation has greatly benefited mankind. Well, I would amend that last statement. The invention of the corporation has greatly benefited the top 1% of mankind. Um, I'm not doing well on profound comments at this point. It's late and, and I haven't had enough sleep. But there was a book published uh, about 20 years ago called Pink Collar Worker that um, makes the point, one of the points that our speaker made in the beginning of women's work, uh, of women workers being paid less. And they did an analysis of um, wages for all categories of women workers, including professionals. And it turns out that uh, the one of the uh, one of the uh, occupations or professions that require the most preparation, which is librarian, and you have to have a master's degree, the average wages are really low. Uh, with a master's degree, you make uh, $35,000 a year or something, or, or $30,000 a year. Most fun. other... <laughs> At any rate, so that and and that across the board, all occupations or professions that were identified as women's occupations or professions, nursing, teaching, librarians, um, housekeepers, homemaker, uh, people who uh, take care of children, were rated lower, not only in. Um, in salary, but also in status, in terms of how they were regarded, um, as uh, how they were regarded by people. So that you had, for example, in Denver, Colorado, when the nurses at the city hospital filed suit against the city, against the city, saying that they were, that the hospitals were fix it, were essentially had a, a gentleman's agreement, as it were, to fix wages for nurses. Mm -hmm. And it's because the nursing wages were pretty much uniform across the city with some, with some differences, what happened is that, that the prerequisite for a nursing supervisor, um, which required a bachelor's degree and, um, and then supervisory experience, the pay for that was less than it was for a stationary engineer. And when you consider the responsibilities of nurses versus engineers in terms of um, at any rate, the, the, when you think of responsibilities of nurses in terms of, of taking care of people, being responsible for lives and, and the health of, of people in hospitals, and that they're, they're really not paid. Um, and that hospitals basically, well, as I've been a nurse for almost 40 years, so I'm awfully familiar with all of that. At any rate, um, but that's across the board, and that really is one of the, one of the main, one of the historical, um, back, uh, historical background for this particular problem, that people who take care of people um, are oftentimes really not paid at all, or paid very low. So, um, the other thing that happened is that when I was um, worked as a visiting nurse in Brooklyn, we supervised um, caregivers in homes that were paid for by Medicaid. And what happened is you had, uh, oftentimes the, the, the care workers were, paid, were placed 
um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so you had two workers, but you had two workers that, that shared the job responsibilities. But they were paid, if they were 24 hours and, and uh, five days, or 24 hours and four days, or whatever, they were only paid for 12 hours of that day, even though they were in the home for 12 hours. Or they were only paid for 12 hours, even though they were in the home for 24. And what was really odd is they kept cutting this program, but what happened is this program was keeping people out of nursing homes where the state would have to pay four times or five times as much to keep a person, uh, to support a person in a nursing home as they would to keep them in their own home um, and have a worker come in and help the person with, um, with bathing and, and cooking and shopping and, and house cleaning and all of that. So we, you know, we're kind of our, you know, the 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 whole point about this is is, uh, or that somehow that this sort of ulterior motive that's behind these programs, are that they're there to make money for other people and uh, the people who are working in them and the the people who are are supposed to benefit from these programs really don't sometimes. Yeah, that's a, not very organized, but that's my statement. Before I say what I was going to say, I noticed that suddenly got quiet next door over there. Ah, uh, well, silence, as they say, is golden. Yeah. Um, I would also say, with regard to Messrs. Ford and Carnegie, that Senator Tro uh, Harry Truman, then a U.S. Senator, addressed, Con addressed the U.S. Senate one day, and he pointed out in his little talk that the blood of the Car that the Carnegie libraries are steeped in the blood of the Homestead steel workers, steel strikers, and that the Rockefeller Foundation was founded on the dead bodies of the workers of the, Cal of the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. I think it's important that we not ignore that. And Harry Truman also served as the vice chair of the Senate Interstate and Foreign Commerce Committee. And at a time when the chairman, Senator Burton Wheeler, was dealing with other matters, the committee conducted a series of, of relatively publicized hearings into the state of the railroad industry and the corruption and thievery that was going on there. And when Senator Truman reported on, his, on, the, on the committee's findings to the Senate, he pointed out in his speech that Jesse James and his gang had to get up early and risk their lives in order to rob the Rock Island Railroad for $3,000. And he went on to add, Senators can see what pikers Mr. James and his gang were alongside of some real artists. <laughs> <laughs> if capitalism is so marvelous, why are why is the uh, global warming taking place and the fossil fuel industry is making billions and we're fighting terrorists with billions of dollars and trillions of dollars in military equipment, but we're not doing anything about global warming that might mean extinction for the human race. Ooh. That's capitalism. If you want to read a good book, get Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick, The Untold History of the United States. You can get it out of the library. I just got through reading it. and gives you the real history of US imperialism around the world, how, how exploitation has taken place over the past 114 years by U.S. imperialism. So you say capitalism doesn't work. You say that we don't have any innovation in it and it exploits workers. Well, I'll give you one good example of the most recent phenomenon that capitalism has provided. Google. Google. <laughs> Exactly, Frank. Yeah, the development of we the internet, know, the rise of the silicon chip, 
the rise of the world changing phenomenon of bringing information together and getting people organized. That would not have been possible without the developments of the innovation, particularly in the early 50s, by such by the innovations that the innovative chip did. I'm forgetting the name of the company. I think it's Silicon Graphics that developed the chip. Bell Labs. A Bell quasi, Labs was a quasi governmental agency. Right. Anyway. But then it came out, and what was the name of the first company that the guys who abandoned Bell Labs and brought it in? Uh, American Semiconductor or something? Fairchild. Like? It was a Fairchild. Fairchild. And then what was the, after Fairchild? Intel. Intel. As we said, though, they were developed the model of where we were able to get venture capital to be able to incubate small companies. A lot of small companies, if they didn't rise up, to go bankrupt and other companies could perform. And that, basically, that model of innovation is what caused a lot of our spectacular rise of the computer revolution in the last 30 to 40 years. And I don't know about you, but isn't there a little something called the internet that kind of brought everything forward in the last, that's been a game-changing technology in the last few years? We know it started out with government incubation, but it was privatized and exploited and made to work for the consumer. And it's very, very it's basically moved around the world to empower a lot of countries to develop. The information revolution today can empower a country to become wealthy almost overnight if you give it a chance. The problem now is when you address global warming, we just don't have an effective power source that's cheaper than coal yet. I think there are some on the horizon, but you're going to need what Obama is doing with all of the above strategy. We're, we need to keep developing. We need to keep developing to, to, to solve these problems. And I think, personally, we will. I know this is not the question and answer time. Well, I've been forgetting to tell you guys for some time. Get up and ask them. If labor is the sole source of value, why can't the hostess workers make Twinkies and <coughs> uh, cupcakes and uh, oh, what else do they make? Why can't they make all that stuff? without the company. Why do you need labor or capital? <coughs> why can't you do production? If, if labor is a sole source of value, why don't you just do it with labor? I, I don't know how the basic issue of uh, uh, exploitation came to uh, Intel, and Intel and, and Bel Air and coal and energy. Guys, we are talking here about the humanizing human being in the times of enlightenment, or so-called expected enlightenment. And <laughs> there was a, a, a debate about uh, the economy in Israel, which goes very much now like follows the uh, pattern here in the United States. Um, some of the ministers complained that the economy is so bad because people refuse to die. You know, they hold on to the altar and, 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 and uh, don't want to die. And, and also how hard it is to get rid of the children. Um, what is important to remind, and that's also about exploitation, that some people like exploitation, what a bullshit. Um, this time is me, Mac, but I, I, I can't find, this is a gentle word, but the economy is for the people. It's not the people for the economy, and yeah. that's what we have to remember. Yeah. I'm Michael Foley. I know this is not the question and answer time, but I really wanted to ask you a question. And all you other guys that brag about how wonderful capitalism is. First place, capitalism does not exist in the United States of America. The economic system we have in this country is bribery and armed robbery. <laughs> rich people, rich people go to the politicians and give them a bribe. And the politicians send their gunslingers throughout the land to collect taxes with us, from us. 
and the gunslingers bring the tax money back to the politicians' office, and they all split it up. The bribe-giving masters get billions and billions. The politicians get his chump change, and the gunslingers get theirs. The question is, what happens when all these big shot companies, these capitalist companies, making their billions and billions and billions, and then for whatever reason, they fall on hard times, and they go broke, but they don't go out of business. That's when they start getting billions and billions of welfare checks from the government. <laughs> if there was capitalism in this country, there would be no AIG insurance company, which got a $185 billion welfare check, and a lot of that money was used to bail out international banks in the Cayman Islands and in Europe. There would be no more General Motors Company, which got a $185 billion welfare check. The ten biggest banks in this country got their welfare checks in the billions and billions, including the Northern Trust Company in downtown Chicago. And I have to say I got money in that bank. But they would not be around, not been for the welfare country that we live in, where the politicians take their bribe money from companies like all those, and get money that comes right out of our pockets and given to these big companies. It's just that simple. There is no such thing as capitalism in the United States of America because there just isn't, because there is welfare for people who give lots and lots of bribe money to politicians. And the bribes are paid off when the gunslingers come to us and put guns at our head. That is how taxes are collected, one way or another. Every law in this country has a guy with a gun standing behind it. You obey the law, or you will be bludgeoned into submission into obeying the law, and if you continue to resist, you'll be bludgeoned to death. That's what law is. A guy with a gun standing there telling you what to do. And in our country, the guys with the guns tell you to empty out your mother effing pockets and the gunslingers and the politicians and their bribe-giving masters split up all our money. I'm always intrigued by the way in which the subject of the College of Complexes uh, talk changes from the poor plight of domestic workers, for example, <laughs> into rampant capitalism and um, <laughs> lots of other things. Um, Tim Bolger is right. Capitalism was a progressive uh, step in the development of society. Uh, it was greater than the individual uh, craftsmen who worked prior to the industrialization. Uh, industrialization, of course, e eventually uh, became capitalism, and it was a progressive force. It uh, made a lot of people rich. It provided other things for society that it didn't have or couldn't get because of the limitations of uh, the, crafts, uh, the craftsmen. Uh, but capitalism has long since lost its progressive uh, aspects. Yes, uh, we get a lot of things. The internet is wonderful. Uh, it wasn't invented by a capitalist. No, it was uh, our by And, and uh, it, has, it has made a, a, a few people very rich at the expense of most of the rest of us. But nonetheless, it is time for capitalism to move on. It's not going to do it itself. Capitalists are not going to say, we give up, we, we've uh, got everything we want, we're now going to uh, turn this over to the labor uh, movement. No, the labor movement is going to have to beat butt in order to uh, eliminate capitalism and make a society where everything is available for everybody. All right, so I'm see another cut. I will too. Now, I've actually heard that capitalism works. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it works. Yes. You actually, it's inconceivable to me. And Nick came here. We just showed you about 50 slides of how capitalism works with the absence of 
union organizing or legislation or labor laws. This is a good, very good example of what happens. And he showed you slide after slide of people working incredible hours in the worst conditions whatsoever. And in what fashion can you say this system works? How does it, it works, I guess, perhaps, if you're the employer, but it certainly doesn't work for the mass of the employees, the 800,000 people who comprise the system. There's no, here, it's amazing. As you almost had an example here of like employment in a vacuum. And look what happens. And they were excluded from, from guys like me coming in and organizing them. So they're, they're, they're victim, they're, they're open, they're way out there. I mean, they're, they're, they have nothing at all. And the capitalist employer sees on the opportunity. And they get away with as much as they can. They cheat them, they tell them, oh, you get money, or every conceivable thing that he could come up with a mistreatment was in one of those slides. There weren't any left out. I mean, it's just, I mean, and you say it works. I guess if you're, if you're on the category of people who are the exploiters, I guess that's utilitarian type of work system, but you can really see what happens. And Sid is entirely correct. This is the one nation on earth where this happens way too much. You think this is such an advanced country. We have absolutely no labor laws in comparison to the rest of the world. What's really dangerous and nefarious about the system he described tonight is they're doing, they're doing this recruitment on a worldwide basis. That shows you what they're up to. And there's no, there's no boundaries whatsoever. There's no boundaries where they secure the, the personnel, and there's no boundaries whatsoever what they're doing to the people. And look what they are doing to the people. Those are indisputable facts. Mm -hmm. He didn't make up that stuff. I know. They went out there and he gathered the data, and he said this is what is actually happening every day to the best of the information that I got through my survey, my data collection. That's what's actually taking place. So you tell me if this is the capitalist system, oh, we can have capitalism, but it's you end up with a yes but. Because yes, we can have but, we're gonna have to do something. Because you cannot allow capitalism without some containment or some mechanism to change it. Because in its purest form, this is the ideal form of employment that everyone on earth would be subjected to. They don't care how many hours you work, they don't care what you're paid, anything at all. There's total disregard. This is wide open as it gets. This is wide open. And that's really, that's really kind of scary to me. You know, and we're going backwards, man. And, and we're letting it happen. And we're going into this notion that these things that the Republican Party is that these exploiters, oh, we need them, or if you if you go with the other guys, you're going to be unemployed, and uh, things work. Things are worth. Listen, go with the Republicans, and you'll be worse off than these these domestic workers. I guess <laughs> <laughs> is that possible? <laughs> is it is it at all possible to have worse working conditions than what it is now? Anyhow, maybe that's just where I'm at, but I, I'm serious. I'm, I sit and read these statistics all the time. I just shake my head. You know, and believe you me, the United States, I'm surprised why they're even recruiting overseas, you know, because quite frankly, they, they're doing that right here every day. It must, you know, the places, these restaurants, these are the, these are the next in line. You think, you think domestic houses are bad. The restaurant, service, anywhere in the service community, you're going to find that stuff over and over and over. Thank you.
too, bro. <laughs> Competition for the mic. Yeah, everybody spoke twice. No, it just, uh, it, it just came to me. We came back today, some of us, from uh, a talk by Kim Sipes um, about capitalism, too. And uh, it, it kind of hit me. I didn't realize that 15% uh, of uh, people in this country of Americans fall under what they called poverty, but listen what poverty is. It's, what was it, 22,000 a year for a family of four. How can you survive on that? With all the, it's a wonderful thing to have the internet and to have the Hiltons <laughs> and to have all of this, but what are you going to do with, with this? And, this is called poverty. I can't imagine um, what what do they call people who get thirty thousand with four people or, or, or whatever. Um, it's a very very low bar. So um, we are not doing very well for the most prosperous, wonderful land in the world. Poverty is a relative thing, and so is exploitation. It's all relative. Now the question is, what is the possibility of, what are the possibilities of this society? How are you going to provide for the general needs? We do not, however, produce for people's needs, we produce for profit. And that is why the production is screwed to making profit and not uh, for meeting people's needs. And uh, when you have production scheduled, uh, invested in uh, for only a um, making profits, you get a whole lot of waste, you get a lot of needs ignored because people don't have the means of the, in the efficient demand, effective demand, uh, for the uh, goods and services that are needed. It's uh, a maldistribution. It's uh, an effective uh, demand. Uh, how do you make for uh, effective demand for the services and the goods that are needed? Uh, we have uh, the, the problem with uh, the domestic workers is that the sexual division of labor of ancient society is perpetuated in the evaluation of the yeah. worth of a production. If we don't reward uh, the, uh, the homemaker, the, uh, the woman uh, who is producing children and a home, food, and so on. I mean, I, I, I believe that good meals could be produced and are being, to some extent, produced, you know, the TV dinner uh, with, uh, uh, in a way that if, if, of the, the demand were, uh, if, if people had the means to demand the, the kind of dinners that could be made, you, you could ignore the, the, the uh, cook, and the domestic cook. You don't need domestic cooks today. You don't. And uh, 
that sort of work is superfluous. But it, it can be that uh, other forms of labor can be, uh, or work, uh, can be more creative, more rewarding. The question is, how do you do that in our society? And uh, that means a transformation of production and exchange. It's a whole new society that, you, that has to be worked out, made, and uh, the late K. Myers was one of those who were interested in making a cooperative society where producer co-op were the general means of production and consumer co-ops were the ma major uh, means of uh, consumption distribution. She uh, had a an advanced sort of uh, perspective on society that uh, has not been reflected in uh, the remarks of our uh, assemblage tonight. Um, I guess I forgot to say that the, the uh, movie, The uh, Chasing Ice, is going to be at the Facets, and it's going to be tomorrow, unfortunately, at 3 o'clock, which is the same time as Kay Meyer's uh, uh, commemoration here, but also it'll be Monday night at 6, Tuesday at 8.30, and Thursday at 8.30 p.m. And actually, just as a parting shot, this movie really does show sort of how unfettered capitalism is leading to the destruction of the of the world as we know it, to the extinction of human beings, to the extinction of, of much of the animal life and plant life on this earth because of the uh, fossil uh, use of fossil fuels, which is in fact the uh, the fuel of industrialization. We could not have had industrialization or capitalism if we did not use fossil fuels to uh, run our industries and our cars and produce energy for us. So um, this fits right in. And uh, basically, we're destroying ourselves with capitalism. Uh -oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad Margaret brings up the point about destroying our world via burning fossil fuels. It, but the thing is, we're not going to get off fossil fuels soon. That's why you're going to need some form of nuclear power. The way we're doing it now is bad. You get a thorium li liquid fluoride thorium reactor involved along with a few other things. Power the size of about, maybe the size of this restaurant to a power about half of North Chicago, you got it made, and you're all set. It needs to be cheaper than coal, and I think we got our problem solved. Oh, yeah. Jim is an expert on the engineering of reactor. <laughs> and he's, he's telling us. Let me just say, I got I to run. I have a teenage daughter who needs to be picked up. So, um, all right. All right. <laughs> you guys solve the rest of the problem. Any more speakers? I used to eat lunch in a little restaurant, and there was an Italian immigrant girl that worked there, uh, mostly cleaning up. And the guy that owned the place talked to her real nasty one day, very bad, and I felt sorry for her. And he, uh, when he wasn't there, I said to her, I said, why don't you come work for me? I need somebody to clean up my place three days a week. I said, I'll pay you more than he pays. She said she'd like to see the place. So I invited her to come over. 
she came over, she says, oh, this place is so big, I could never clean it up. I said, just do the same work you did for him three days a week for three hours a week, and I'll pay you. I said, I don't expect you to do everything. She kept on complaining about, oh, I couldn't do this. And I, I, finally, I said, well, I got a better idea. Why don't you just stay home, and I'll mail you a check every week. Would that be okay? And that's the problem with a lot of these uh, the so-called laborers and domestics in there. So they don't really want to do it. So By the way, I'm not finished telling you something else. The fact is, the gentleman over here in the black hat who said we don't live under capitalism was absolutely right. We've never lived under capitalism. Uh, Ayn Rand wrote a book entitled oh. Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. We do not live under capitalism, nor have we ever. And that's the problem with this country. Thank you, thank you, sir.